or not. And this uh, event is being recorded and will be posted on the Thomas and Angela Public Library website um, beginning on Monday on our YouTube channel. So you just go to our website, you click on resources and scroll down to YouTube channel and you can watch this in its entirety anytime. Okay, uh, and after she has finished uh, doing some reading from her book and explaining uh, her story to us, then we'll have time for question and answers, not only here in person, but also at home. And this is our first hybrid ever. So we're pretty excited about this opportunity. And now I will mute myself and I'm gonna take myself off camera as well um, to increase our, our bandwidth uh, and, and how that will transmit. So take it away, Victoria. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. <clears throat> I really appreciate it. And I think we'll start by showing a couple of the photos. Um, the first one that will come up is just the title of the book and um, uh, I can show it to you. It's called Aria for a Farm, Lean Together or Fall Alone. Um, it happens to be um, an actual photograph of my Molly and my Dandy, um, my neighbors that we bought uh, the bobsled and uh, neighbor's barn. And there it's, it has a title. And below the title, you can see a picture of a man and a cow. The man and a cow are a uh, typical of what we would have seen um, far side over there. Uh, anywhere in um, this area in the 1930s, and that's the setting of my uh, novel is the 1930s. The photo below that one, um, excuse me, on our on the screen, it'll be below. And over here, uh, it is uh, 2A. And that is called the Alan Hansen postcard from 1911. Um, and that's Turtle Lake. Uh, when the photo is up, you'll be able to see the street, the main street of Turtle Lake. It has horses and bobsleds. It's a 1911. And if you would go to Turtle Lake and walk down the street, it would look very much the same. And today was the first time I stopped in at the Chamber of Commerce in Cumberland and found some photos that I wish I would have had several weeks ago because your downtown in Cumberland looks very similar to what it did in the 30s also. So I think it's very typical. This um, uh, novel that I've written is um, typical of life in Turtle Lake. And, and the novel is about people from Turtle Lake, Cumberland, Almina, all of the uh, towns around. Um, the, are we able to get the next photo maybe? Well, if not, let me, um, let me do this. Let me read to you some, the beginning of Aria for a Farm. Chapter one, he's gone. Claudia walked into the farm kitchen. The house seemed the same, but wasn't. Earlier that morning, she'd left her father at the kitchen table mending harness, and there he was, all in hand, as if waiting to put in the next stitch. His head was on the table, face down. He never took a nap at the table. He wouldn't put his head down there. She picked the bridle from between her father's cold, stiff fingers without looking into his face. She'd seen enough death to recognize it without staring into vacant eyes. He wouldn't finish the leather. If the stitches were going to be put in, she'd have to do them. That was Dandy's only work bridle and she needed to finish the West 40 field work. She kept her eyes and hand fixed on the worn buckle, brass buckle, where the wax thread still hung waiting to be attached to the smooth hand stripped leather strap. Her father had worked the land and cared for their animals with attention and appreciation. She held the corner of the table for the comfort of the wood's stability. Her grandparents' old country mantle clock ticked away the minutes. That's why she'd come in. It wasn't like him to take so long. A couple of hours ago, she'd heard his voice. I'll be out in a bit. Now silence. The noon meal dishes were rinsed and stacked in the sink. Her hand touched the sun-warmed rim of the top plate. He wouldn't need supper, would she? She stared out the window at Dandy, grazing in the pasture. 
Claudia tried not to think too much, go to town, fetch the undertaker. She turned her father's head to the side so he would be more peaceful, less unnatural. Monday and the table was covered with everyday tablecloth of green and yellow patterned flowers on white, where his head now laid. He never took a nap at the table. She wanted air. She grabbed the bridle from the table, her eyes locked on the leather, and she grabbed a piece of twine string from the hook by the door. As she left, the screen door slammed behind her and she called to Dandy. Claudia tied her broad backed Melgen mare to the rail outside the mortuary in the one town, one church, one tavern town of Turtle Lake. She stepped into the workshop, which smelled of turpentine, tongue oil, and varnish, and began speaking. You got to come out to our place. We need you. She paused, then continued more quietly. Not we. Not anymore we. I need you. The undertaker stopped his hammering on a bird's eye maple coffin. She waited the minute for him to straighten so he could look up at her. She noticed that his cataracts were worse than the last time she'd seen him. She didn't know him well, a bit of a strange duck. Sorry about your troubles, but you're out of peace, he said, reflecting on her choice of pronouns. Yes, I know we live a ways out of town. She stood silently waiting. I mean, to get to your place, it takes a bit of doing. I have my horse. We could hitch up your wagon. Ours is full of seed waiting for me to get it in the ground. Well, he scratched the gray stubble on his cheek. Trouble is, I don't know as I can make the trip. My roomie's acting up. God almighty, am I going to have to try to load my father into the wagon myself? See, thing is, the health department says, doctor, me got to go out there and see the body before you go messing with it. He paused and scratched again, this time with the claw end of his hammer on the inner side of his upper leg. Trouble is, Doc's over Pigeon Creek way tending to a baby come too early. Claudia closed her eyes, took a breath, and then continued in a quieter than normal voice. What should I do then? <laughs> You're just going to have to wait till tomorrow. <sighs> what difference is one day going to make? Doc won't be back by then. And if the undertaker can't make the trip today, why would tomorrow be different? She civilized her reply in her mind so it would come out her mouth without biting off his head. That's one thing she'd learned living alone with her father out on the Wisconsin prairie with neighbors few and far between. You don't go bad mouthing or sharp tonguing anyone who you may need tomorrow to help put up a crop or put out a fire. Tomorrow, my nephew from New York City will be coming on the noon train. He's taking over the business. I expect he can go out with you and take care of your dad. This was the first anyone had mentioned her father. The sudden pain in her stomach was like being in the sun too long, running out of water, but wanting to just finish that last row of beans. As she realized that her father's dead body was waiting in their kitchen and would be there one more day in this heat, she looked around for a place to sit. The only open surface was on the beautiful eyes of the maple box much like the red oak one she would, she would choose for her father. Cripes, and I'm gonna have to deal with some greenhorn from out east. If that doesn't just top the heap of manure I'm shoveling. She stepped out the door onto the walk. Well, that's the beginning. And I think we might have some uh, photos, no, to look at. Well, then let me, before we go to the a, a photo. I've been asked several times, um, what started you writing? Why did you do this? Well, most of us have written letters and many of us write journals. And I have felt the compulsion to write ever since I've been alive. But I did not, as I mentioned to you earlier, I did not have the confidence to devote the time to it. Like everybody, I was busy doing a lot of things and taking care of business, working and raising a family. And Jerry Apps gave me permission. I went to a University of Wisconsin Madison class and he said, you have the right to write. You feel the compulsion like people do for knitting or collecting coins or model railroads. And, <laughs> and, and there we have a picture of what I, in my book, call Ernie's General Store, 
In this photo, it's the Turtle Lake Hardware Store. This photo is um, in the 30s. Uh, and I'll tell you right now, if you were to go to Turtle Lake, it looks very much the same. The next photo um, will be of the Bulls, which is the um, next section I'm going to read. This is two men and two bulls. Um, these happen to be Hereford Bulls, which is the kind of um, bull that Claudia's dad had before. Um, and then he got a new kind of cattle called Highland cattle. Um, I think if we go to the next one, that might be good. Okay. I showed you the outside of the hardware store. Now this one is titled Opal Cornwall and John Sterry, 1949. This is the interior of the hardware store. And I can tell you your hardware store in Cumberland looked just the same. Uh, the outside was different. I'm trying to remember the name of, of it. I can't off the top of my head think of it. But as you can see, they sold everything and anything. And when I moved to Turtle Lake in uh, 1972, that hardware store looked exactly the same. That um, library uh, ladder that goes along the uh, rail was still there. And when this store was sold just a few years ago, it didn't have the stoves in it anymore or refrigerators, but it was pretty much exactly the same, which tells me that we are people the same throughout time. We have the same needs and desires. Um, and I will be, Ernie's general store is in my book and it's based on Cornwall Sterry. Then the next scene we'll see um, of the photos is of uh, the main street in the 1920s. The one before showed a winter scene and it was the horses and um, bobsleds. This one you can see is vehicles <clears throat> and it's about the 1920s, 1930s. And like I mentioned, uh, the town looks pretty much the exact same. The same way with Cumberland. I mentioned earlier that I had just found some photos today at the Commerce uh, Chamber of Commerce. It's amazing to me how similar it was in the 20s and 30s. And I guess the idea that I'd like us all to come away with is that it's important to keep um, photos and stories alive. And it's important for us to tell our children about these stories and our, our grandchildren. Um, I think I'll go, if we can pause this, I think I'll go to the bull because the next set of photos would be better suited for our next. This um, chapter is from chapter four and it's called The Bull. Claudia would move the bull and repair the fence once and for all. Last year was bad enough when a heifer had been bred early, but not again. With Shep at her heels, she walked with assurance toward the animal she had known since he was a calf. The grass crunched underfoot. The spring day was weirdly hot. Yet the sky could fill with crowd, clouds and burst into a bone chilling rain in minutes. Rain had fallen for a few minutes yesterday, but the dirt was already dusty. By the time Claudia closed the distance, the bull was facing her with his head down. She licked the salty perspiration that clung to her lip and stung her eyes. She had intended to transfer Bully to his pasture, then tighten the four strand barbed wire. She'd never considered how far from the safety of the fence her father had been when he went into the pasture, but that thought raced through her mind now as she saw dust rise from where Bully pawed. She heard his low rumble, and she responded as she had when he was a calf. She mooed to him. He charged. She froze. She snapped her arm with the stick out in front of her and connected with his forehead before he ran her over, his broad legs straddling each side of her body. She lay on her back, stunned, grit in her mouth. Bully turned, sniffed at her, returned to the side of the heifer in heat. He sniffed and mounted the heifer before Claudia reached the safety of the field side of the fence. She wanted to go. She wanted to leave, go home. She hadn't been trampled, but she was bruised and shaken. The pasture charged with dust, musk, and atmospheric electricity could be left to the bull and his prize but that broken fence remained. She picked up the bucket of fence supplies and reappraised the area where Bully had pushed through, popping the one inch staples and loosening the posts. 
She refused to leave the fence and let the bull win. For the next hour, she hammered, pulled, and stretched. The fence barbs bit through the glove right where she gripped the wire and pulled. She tugged the glove from her hand and the blood streamed down. She would not let emotion wash over her or pull her down a black hole. The blood had soaked through her glove. She calculated how far it was back to the house and how much daylight was left. Oh, she wished she could send Shep who was asleep under a tree to fetch a bandage for her. She tore the bottom edge of her t-shirt and wrapped the cloth around her palm. The bleeding staunched, she returned to stretching, pounding and wheeling to the next post. Once the fence was secured, bull should be led back into his own pasture. Encroaching clouds were lashed and thundered as she pounded and pushed. Feelings of failure had left little room for attention to the bank of ominous clouds that preceded a storm. The rain began just as her physical strength was depleted. She continued to fight post and the wire was now slippery in her bloody gloved hands. She stumbled across the softening ground, scouring for rocks big enough to secure the posts that had been loosened by the bull's efforts to get at the heifers. The thunder and lightning were so close, the sky so dark, she wanted to get out of there, but she refused to let the rain keep her from finishing. That must have happened last year. Perhaps the reason her father hadn't finished securing everything. When she'd reattached the wire to the last post, the sun was down. That better keep Bully in. Maybe father hadn't noticed the wires had gotten slack and the posts loose. Any bull worth his salt would test a fence if the mood came over him or it had an itch, whether that itch was on his back or in the shape of a heifer on the other side of the barrier. But this is where brain beat brawn. She plucked the top wire like a banjo. Yep, that was as tight as old man miser. She just had to secure this last post with a few more rocks at its base, just in case Bully got the urge to scratch himself again. She had already scrounged all the rocks outside the pasture and all those close to the fence. She had to venture deeper into the pasture, closer to Bully and his harem. As she bent down next to the post to push the last rock in at its base, she failed to notice the bull pawing the ground. With the thunder cracking above her, neither she nor Shep heard the bull's snorting. A moment earlier, she'd been out in the open. If the bull had charged her then, he'd have gored her or flung her repeatedly across the pasture. Thankfully, she was next to the post when he felt she had invaded his space once too often. He stampeded toward her, his one-ton bulk hitting her bent over body his massive head ramming her and pinning her to the ground, the great horns on each side of her. Shep had finally run to her side and was crouched inches behind her, barking hysterically, ears flat to his head. The bull had knocked the breath out of her, but she was ungored, turning her head and looking up into his face that as a calf she had held in her two hands, she saw the irrational flare of rage. His breath was hot and steamy, he lifted his head to ram her again, or maybe to ram the outraged dog. The hor bull's horns tangled in the now taut bottom wire. She smelled his strong urine as he relieved himself in frustration. Pushing herself further into the mud while Shep dug at the earth next to her head, she crawled under the wire, but not before leaving her shirt on the fence. She clawed her way for several feet, then stood and ran through the safety of the field without thinking. Shep close at her heels. The fence would, hope, would hold, she hoped, but she couldn't be sure. Consider separating the bull from the heifers now was pointless. Dark had descended and she couldn't see clearly through the sheets of rain. She stumbled. She wanted out of the rain and dirt and mud and off this farm. <clears throat> well, Claudia, um, is trying to do everything herself and finds that she needs other people. And maybe we will see some photos that uh, give an instant of that. I can talk to you about the times when people in small towns in the 30s absolutely had to have uh, people helping them. One um, instance, which will be the next section I read, is a thrashing bee. Um, when the photo comes up, you'll be able to see that a thrashing bee does require numerous people. 
Um, if you've ever been to the one down at Moon Lake, um, it's a behemoth machine. It's huge. It's got, uh, there we go, uh, threshing beef. It's got wheels and belts and you can see all the men and horses and wagons. I mean, it's an accident waiting to happen. And um, there are a bunch of men out there doing the thrashing where they're uh, cutting the grain and um, winnowing it and uh, putting it on a conveyor and, and separating. Um, there's a lot of uh, work involved and they, the way that it would be is one person owned the machine and that person would travel and all the neighbors would get together and they would thrash at everybody's house. So you had to help everybody in order to get your own oats and, and wheat and things uh, taken care of. And there were uh, an army of women in the house cooking uh, while, these, uh, while the men were outside. Claudia happens to be the only woman that works with the men. And that's because she was raised by her father. She's very large sturdy woman and very tall and her father just assumed that he would she would do these things so she did all the things that the men did um, another uh photo that uh shows um where we need a lot of people um oh excuse me let me show no nope, nope you're you're right Jeanette the next photo is of a small farm this would be like Claudia's home farm uh, the barn is uh, one of the main things on a farm, and you can see the house. They usually were two-story homes. Um, the thing that is not prominent here, it's uh, uh, in the background, is the windmill, which would pump their water. The other thing that you don't see on this particular uh, photo is a silo, um, and most farms had those silos. Uh, so a, a, a local farm, this would be like Claudia's small. Um, then I think it'll be the next photo is of the barn raising. This is the other time. Now, I think when they took this picture that all the people were having lunch because there are only four people in this picture. And trust me, it takes an army to build these. Now, this barn is uh, similar to it. the one that is um, prominent in my book and on the cover, this barn happens to be Richard and Bobby Fix Barn and Clayton. Um, it's uh, it doesn't have um, rafters in it. The way it's supported is just the ribs, kind of like a cathedral. And that's the theme of my book: is that like this barn, we need each other to support each other. And that's the way it stays up and um, it stays alive because the people and the animals together are in that barn exhaling moisture and people are taking care of the animals and the animals are taking care of the people. This leads right into the next section that I'd like to read, which is called threshing. And something that it would be good for you to know is Claudia is 28 years old in this story. She has her birthday during the book. And um, Hank is one of the uh, male the uh, male character that's in her life. He is a, a neighbor, been born bred country boy. He's 24 years old, so he's younger than she is. Thomas, who is the uh, New York City mortuary man who comes to town, is 34 years old, so he's older. So they are currently threshing at the Johnsons, which is Hank's parents' farm. In Johnson's farmyard, the men sat four on each side of the rough tables made from sawn boards nailed between cut off stumps acting as table legs. Shorter stumps served as legs for the benches on which they sat in their bib overalls and rolled up sleeves. Thomas was in work clothes, but wore a belt rather than the ubiquitous suspenders or bib overalls worn by most of the farmers. Thomas sat cheek to jowl with Hank, who was next to Matthew Reuter, who uh, came over to help with Claudia's and the Mevisons and who would return the favor to the Rooters, but Thomas wouldn't be obliged to go. He had returned from working in New York to help Claudia and her close neighbors. She hadn't asked him to help, but after mentioning it to him on her birthday, he'd responded eagerly. I wouldn't miss this chance to learn what threshing is all about. Thomas was unaware of the potential dangers lurking in this bucolic farm scene but Claudia knew. Farm accidents were regular occurrences. Scan any church meeting or barn dance, count the missing fingers, men with permanent limps, 
those with a hook because a hand had been given to a corn picker in an attempt to unclog gear binding stalks. Everyone on the farm, even Claudia, wore scars from machinery edges and hot stoves. One glance at a threshing operation with spinning wheels and long looping belts, driving, grinding gears, and an accident seemed inevitable. Most of the older men were still sipping the dregs of their coffee when they heard the machines start up. Some of the younger men, not so young as to be held back by fear of reprisal, but not old enough to experience reality's bite, seized the opportunity to prove themselves and get work started. Later, the men in the field understood the boys had been careless. The details didn't matter. Fault wasn't assigned. They were boys being boys. Machines plus boys equal accidents. One of the boys, really a man, but acting like a schoolboy, was attempting to adjust the tension on one of the belts of the behemoth threshing machine. He was the redheaded one who had teased Thomas in the field earlier. Now peripherally, they witnessed what had been a premonition earlier. The redhead, tired of his job forking bundles from the wagon onto the conveyor, decided he was ready for more challenging work. His pant leg had gotten caught and pulled him into the gears that churned relentlessly, regardless of fabric or flesh. He screamed like a pig that had been caught by his back leg, trying to escape the butcher's knife. They saw fear turn the cocky young man into a vulnerable boy. All the other men close at hand were above and couldn't see. As Thomas ran to the boy, he stripped his shirt off and began to rip it in two. He balled up one half and pushed the cloth into the gaping hole and used the other half to bind the quickly sodden scarlet ball to the boy's leg where the gear had ripped a gash. Claudia knelt beside him away from the machine. What should I do? Push on this. He grabbed his hand to hold the cloth on the wound. He grabbed her hand to hold the cloth on the wound. He stripped his belt off, cinched the leather on the boy's thigh above the wound, and then relieved the bloodied Claudia. Thomas held pressure on the wound, all the while holding the boy with his other arm as far as possible out of harm's way of the still whirling drive shaft. Claudia's heart was racing. Hank and George, closest at the time, had stopped the machine, but all the parts took a while to quit moving. The screams had caused action. Pete Mevison had wedged his pitchfork into the machine's jowls as Matthew Ruder grabbed the controls. The long looping belt running from tractor to thresher finally stopped completely. The sun had set before they were able to piece together the different perspectives. The women spoke of the screams heard all the way in the house after the machine grinding had slowed and come to a halt. The Fernier and Anderson boys were quick to tell how everything had been so normal, all going as usual. He mustn't have paid attention. When they were all safely in bed, the redhead boy stitched and in a morphine stupor, they all understood one thing. Doc's comment made that clear. He should have died out there. The main blood supply was hit. They all knew the truth, which Claudia whispered to Thomas that evening. You saved his life. I just did what I know. None of us knew to push so hard. You tied so hard it almost cut off all the circulation in his leg. Thomas gazed down at her, touched her cheek gently. That's the idea. <clears throat> so thrashing is definitely a thing where we need each other. Um, I've been asked also not just how I started writing, but what kept me writing. Um, and I think it's like anybody who does anything, you feel compelled to do it. You feel this passion, this drive. And I was very busy with family, um, parents, kids, grandkids, all the things that life has to do. But um, these people and these scenes kept coming to me and they were in my head demanding to get down on paper. And so, I almost had to do it. And sometimes when I didn't do it, the characters would quit talking to me. They were like upset. You aren't going to give me consistent time? Fine. You want to know what your dad did? I'm not telling you. I was so upset. I did all this, you know, reading of, of, of newspapers during that time period to find out what had happened. What did Claudia's dad do that was so bad? And what what was going on at the time that made her 
you know, it's during the depression. Why couldn't she make a go of it? Why were, why were these bad things happening? So I, I did a lot of um, uh, research and I, and it was interesting and I loved it. And I think it's like anybody, whether you're a quilter, a runner, a gardener, a model railroad, my husband's a model railroader, you have this passion and you love it. And yes, sometimes it's hard and frustrating. He'll sometimes come in and he'll be just like, oh, you know, or a scrapbooker. My neighbor is a scrapbooker and she gets frustrated sometimes. And I think we're all like that, but we, it's a, it's a passion with us. And for me, I, I've known, I, I like people, I like old people, I like young people, and I knew these people. And the people that are in this book are composite characters. They're combinations of people I know. And they were in my head wanting to have a voice. And so this book was a chance for them to say their piece what they knew about farming, what they had learned, things they could have maybe told their children uh, if their kids had been interested. I regret that I never asked my grandma's things. You know, I, I'd give anything to have a day with them so I could ask them all kinds of stuff. So this was by me interviewing people and, and things that I know from my own personal experience, it was my opportunity to give these characters a stage, a platform on which to talk. And um, I guess that's why I, kept doing it. Um, if we might have a few more photos, maybe uh, just a couple. Um, I've got to see if I've, oh, I know what. People also ask me, what was the challenge? And what was the, um, I told you what was fun, being in the zone. Um, the other time I'm in the zone is singing, singing for church. I'm in that zone. Uh, the problems, time, and technology. I am not good at technology, and, and that was definitely an issue for me. I'm very grateful that uh, people like Jeanette know how to do a, and set up pictures like this. I, I don't know how to do this. Um, the picture that's on the screen, and um, for the people here that you can see is called Panorama Turtle Lake 1914 and it shows the depot. And I think the, the thing that I like about it is this is a glimpse into the past when I remember people telling me, oh, I used to take the uh, train um, from Turtle Lake up to Cumberland. We'd go see our friends. I could go in the morning, we could stay for lunch, I'd go home. There would be like five, 10 trains a day going from Turtle Lake to Cumberland. It was unbelievable. When I interviewed the man from Spooner about the trains, he was like showing me all these uh, schedules. I was just flabbergasted. And uh, people that I interviewed would say, oh yes, we used to go to Amory. We used to go uh, to Barron. We could go all over, go to Rice Lake. You just had to make one stop, you know, one change. And um, this kind of shows that how busy it was. And a photo that I found at the Chamber of Commerce showed the same thing in Cumberland. You folks had a very busy train station. Um, then our, our I'd like to, the last slide, I, I've got to give credit. The Turtle Lake Museum is the, um, who is responsible for these photos. And um, uh, they're gonna be starting to be open again now. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, Dave Skrupke because Dave Skrupke is the one that uh, collected all the photos from people that were getting rid of them, um, you know, didn't want them any longer. Um, so I'm very appreciative of that. I'm appreciative of the Chamber of Commerce in Cumberland for giving me those photos. And hopefully I can maybe next, the next book that I do will have uh, photos and more about Cumberland. Who knows? I know a lot of people in Cumberland might happen. Um, I think we have enough time so that I can read the last um, selection I have, and it's from chapter 26, and then we'll open it up to uh, questions from the people here. And if you have a question, uh, Jeanette uh, will take care of that, but you just click on that chat button and type in your question. It's at the bottom of your screen and um, she'll take care of that because she knows how to do that stuff. Chapter 26, The O'Briens. 
The lost child was Mrs. O'Brien's second youngest who was not yet five. Mrs. O'Brien dispatched her eldest to the neighbors for help when she faced a crisis beyond her ability to fix. Her face frantic, the 12 year old girl showed up at Claudia's door out of breath. Ma said to come get you, we need help. We can't find our little brother. We've been looking for hours. Can you go to town to ask for help, please? Anxious to be of immediate assistance, Claudia stopped briefly at the Johnsons to urge Hank to recruit help from town while she and Mrs. Johnson gathered up food and proceeded to the O'Briens. Mrs. O'Brien had collapsed on the ground, clutching her youngest, a two and a half year old girl and rocking back and forth. Claudia and Mrs. Johnson bent down to the woman whose face was streaked with tears and sweat and dirt and pulled her upright, still clutching her daughter who alternately attempted to get herself free and allowed her mother to confine her like a kitten caught in a toddler's loving grip. Prying Mrs. O'Brien's fingers open, the women permitted the child to slip away into the house while they supported the mother's weight between them. Mrs. O'Brien poured the story out as if throwing up a tainted bowl of stew. Why didn't I remind them to stay together? They should know better. I shouldn't have to tell them. Despite his crippled like Mr. O'Brien and me, us all been looking since we noticed the young'un was gone. They was all playing in the swamp grass since the meadow's been cut. Oh, God, please don't let them disappear in the swamp. You know those kids, they jump swamp humps. If he fell off and got stuck and sucked down into the swamp, Jesus, Mary and Joseph will never find him. What'll I do? She leaned heavily into the two women. Let's go into the house so you can sit down and we can get you something to drink, Claudia urged. Mrs. Johnson supported a cloth covered basket on her arm, which Claudia knew had to be heavy. Oh dear Lord, we hadn't had dinner. He'll be hungry. Mrs. O'Brien wailed. They carried the food they'd brought and the woman into the house. Moments later, outside, they heard the Johnsons pick up, pull into the yard. Through the window, they saw half a dozen men and a few women get out and start to form into groups. The women came into the house with baskets of bread, cheese, and meats. The men walked toward the swamp and woods carrying unlit lanterns. Dusk was approaching and they would need illumination soon. As dark descended, the O'Brien children returned and dropped off their younger siblings. The three eldest grabbed a lantern, a sandwich each in their jackets and returned to the search. The women fed the younger children, threw grain to the chickens, slopped the pig and sat down with sighs to hot coffee and Mrs. O'Brien's nervous chatter and waited. An hour after the sun had set, the women huddled in the kitchen heard the voices. By the uplifted sound, they knew the almost five-year-old had been found. Sweat chilled men stomped their mud caked feet and stuffed the little house. Once fed and washed, the children crawled under their quilts in their beds that crowded the front room, and they listened to the adults as they filled their growling stomachs and rehashed the evening's events. Mr. O'Brien had a small jug of hard cider that he passed among the men. He hobbled from one to another, shaking hands and passing the jug with grateful thanks. Oh, these old shambling legs can of stomp through the swamp like before. I cannot thank you enough. Where was he, big Mrs. O'Brien? The story flowed like water from a primed pump, full, broad, replete with details. Mr. O'Brien began. Oh, the children had been playing hide and seek and did not see that none of them had been watching Aaron. Sharon scuffed her knee and our eldest Siobhan were tending to her. She'd last seen Aaron with his brothers. Events get a bit muddled after. They tried looking for him, but got scared and come home to get us. Aaron told me he was played in hide and seek and when no one found him, he come out. With everyone gone, he went to look for him. He got tired and found a tree to crawl into and fell asleep. The tree were a ways from where us family were looking, but he mustn't have heard us. With more folk, we covered more ground. He popped out of the dark like one of the wee folk or a mischievous ghost, he's stepping out of a tree. It's rotten base were dug out on one side by some animal torn to big space, but he could fit in and were hidden. When he woke, he said he got scared by the voices. The sounds weren't familiar and they sounded angry. So he kept himself hidden. Aaron told me he heard his name song and seen the fireflies that come to lead him home. Patrick, the eldest confessed that he, as he searched, he took to sing an Aaron's song like Ma did to soothe the young one when he were a wee bairn. Aaron wanted to catch one of them fireflies must have seen our swinging lanterns. 
Patrick and several of you can back me up. Aaron come out of that tree, clap, singing his name song and reaching out to grab a firefly. Well past supper and chores, the neighbors who had left their responsibilities for a few hours returned to their farms and to town to do their own chores and put their own children to bed. Under her own quilt, alone in her own bed, Claudia thanked God that they weren't alone. They had each other, in spite of all the hardship that pursued their town and township. Together, they could manage. And that's the theme of the novel is lean together or fall alone. Um, and I think we are ready to open it up for questions. Oh man, that's probably one of my kids. Yikes, what have I learned about myself or else somebody who knows me really well. I learned a tremendous about, amount about myself. <clears throat> I did not realize it until after the book was finished that this book really was a way for me to deal with things that were happening in my life. And when my publisher said, um, Victoria, what is the reason or why did you write this book? Um, and I said, grief and gratitude sparked the conception. And then later, life-changing health concerns and the loss of loved ones fueled the author's writing. Abundant goodwill of towns, folk, and city uh, friends who populate the pages as composite characters from her, her community ignited her desire to capture the sometimes annoying, but usually redeeming compulsion of neighbor to help neighbor in trying times. So what did I learn about myself? What I learned is that <clears throat> I have a lot of qualities that Claudia has. I'm um, independent, strong-willed. Um, I feel capable. I think she's very capable. Um, I learned that I had a lot of grief that I needed to deal with. Um, like everybody in this room who has lost a loved one, um, that is difficult to deal with, uh, whether it's by death or divorce or any kind of a loss. If they, uh, my mother uh, had temp frontal temporal de dementia and I lost her many years ago. She just died this March. Um, it, so it was a, a, a slow, a stealing away, a slow losing of her. Um, and, and this book is about uh, dealing with loss. Uh, I can't reveal everything to you, but Claudia loses a lot of things that are very important to her. Animals and land are very important to her and people are very important to her. She's not a very personable person, but people matter to her. And I think in the course of the novel, she learns how important people are. Um, I think it was Linda today in uh, at the co-op. Uh, now I can't remember what it was, but I thought, yeah, I think you're right, Linda. Claudia did figure that out, you know. And and sometimes you don't know those things until you're done. And I think maybe even a person that like does a quilt and then they're all done with it and they go, holy smokes, that fits the bed perfectly and it's lovely. Or a song, somebody you know is perfectly silent after you've sung this song. And, and music is very important in this book. That's why I, I wanted the cover to have notes on it because Claudia doesn't even know how important it opens a whole world to her. Um, uh, classical music um, that I would have to say there are types of music I have thought just not into it. And uh, once you listen to enough of it, you think, whoa, I can understand that. I can see why that's enjoyable. So I learned a lot, a lot. How about in our, and, and, and folks at, that are at home, just go down to that little chat button and type, uh, click on it and then type in uh, any question you have. But how about the lovely people that are here? What, Pat? Sure, 
Pat just asked, what's the time span that's in the book? <clears throat> and that's a good question. It opens uh, with his, with the, the father's death in May, 1932. And the last chapter takes place in 1933. So it's, um, Oh, excuse me. How can I not know this? But I was just trying to think if it's in the epilogue. It might be in the epilogue that we find out. But I think the last Christmas scene is Christmas of... Um... See, this is what happens to you when you get older. You get to rely on people to help you. Pro yeah, the uh, last scene is Christmas, 1933. So that's December 25th. And then the epilogue, Angels uh, Guiding and Guarding with Music is uh, happens in 34, but that's just this like little taste. Somebody, okay, I'll wait. That answered it, did it? Yes. No, they are not. The... Uh, article that was in the early bird, it was so lovely of Ruth to um, interview me. And I must not have made it clear because in the early bird, it says there are photos in the book. There are not. The photos are from the uh, Turtle Lake Museum. Um, and I like to show them when I present. And I babbled on and on to her about my presentations and what was coming up and what had been. And so we just had a little miscommunication. So no, there are no photos in it. The only one, and you could tear it out and throw darts at it is me in the very back, you know. Yeah. Yes, I donated a copy to the library and you can check it out here. And uh, it's also, uh, they also have, uh, I'll sign copies tonight if someone would like one. The cost is $20. Um, and for people at home, if uh, you want to come into the library, Jeanette has uh, books that are signed by me, and you can um, uh, get one of those. I've got it there. If you make out a check, you make it out to Monarch Tree Publishing, and they know at the library also. And if you want to, you can go online to Monarch Tree Publishing, my publisher, and you can see the thing, and you can order it by credit card if you'd like to. Thank you for asking about that. How about other questions? Yes. Oh, you've read it. Yeah. You hope something does? Yeah, yeah. Randy. Randy Rotman, uh, my girlfriend, um, I said, I've got this character and I know his first name. It's Randolphus, you know, Tobias. Uh, uh, and his nickname is Randy and they all call him RT, you know, cause he's like a rat anyway. But I said, I need a last name. And she said, don't laugh. But I, I, there was a guy that was awful and his name was Rotman. I said, oh man, that's fabulous. Randy Rotman, I love it. So even in the writing of this book, I've had tons of help, uh, you know, from people. But I would have to say this to you and all of the people listening. If you're looking for Randy to die this horrible death, he doesn't. He doesn't. Oh, she doesn't even want that. No, he doesn't. Like all of us, he has um, qualities that are less savory. And I, I think everybody has some qualities that are redeeming in some way. Even the nosy neighbor that asked me when I first moved to town, where were you going? I saw you went that way, uh, but you must not, you must have either gone to the dentist because it was about a half hour, you know, she was doing all this and I thought, oh my goodness. And then I realized I had become one of those when I stopped at a neighbor's because there was a strange car in the driveway. And I thought, I bet they're stealing something from my neighbor's house. I drove in there and I said, can I help you? And they go, no, we were just turning around, pulled into the driveway and we're gonna turn around. I thought, oh, okay. So I became one of those nosy, annoying neighbors. Any other questions? Linda.
You you like that you gave. Oh, yeah. thank you. Okay, um, I I have trouble hearing, and so I I think I heard most of it. And uh, let me. Uh, Linda was kind enough to say that she really enjoyed the story, and she liked the fact that um, there's a chapter in the book that is from Dandy's point of view, this particular horse, um, who doesn't happen to be the feral horse. Molly is a feral horse, which is the boss horse um, in, in a, in a, on a field, but Dandy was the boss in the, in the pasture. And did you ask me, Linda, uh, why did I choose that? Because it's unusual? Yeah, well, it's because it's a horse. That horse that also has been Ah, <clears throat> I'll tell you this. I had a couple of people who read the book. Okay, she asked uh, why I had Dandy speak and why I placed it in the book and where I, why I placed it where I did. I had, um, I was so blessed to have people um, who said they would read the book and, and give me uh, feedback. And one of the people who I respect very much said, get rid of that horse chapter. Nobody's gonna get it. Nobody's gonna relate to it, get rid of it. And then I, had a, I asked another friend who has written many books and I said, a, a, a person I know, I said, what do you think of that chapter? Ah, she said, I didn't really like it. And for me, it was imperative that dandy speak. And the reason is this, when you have animals, and those of you that have cats or, or dogs or any animal that you care about know, you, you de can develop a relationship that is so close. And Claudia developed that relationship with Dandy and Molly. She did not have her mother. Her mother died at, when she was six. The, and her dad was a wonderful man, but it's not the same. Dandy and Molly were there for her. She could lay on their back. She could talk to them. She could do everything with them. Dandy needed to speak because Dandy could feel, knew Claudia very well and knew something wasn't right. And Dandy and Molly have a unique relationship. Um, Anyway, Molly knew something wasn't right, but Molly would never be the one to speak up, Dandy would. So Dandy speaks up and says, this is what I feel. And this is what seems to be going on and talks about something that had happened in the past <clears throat> when Claudia was just tiny, younger. Um, and then a scene follows after it that is um, difficult. And you need to know that relationship between uh, the horses and Claudia in order to understand how devastating the next chapter is to Claudia. And I think anybody that has had to put a cat down or see a horse get shot because its leg was broken or, you know, quit, back in the old days, you would, it was inhumane to not shoot a horse that had broken its leg um, or, any, anything like that, taking it to the vet, you know what it's like. And uh, that's, that's why Dandy had to speak. And I, I once wrote a short story about, it was about cats from the cat's point of view, but you didn't know it until the very end. And to me, it was very important because you got to feel how the cat would feel about her kittens being taken from her and you think in the beginning of the story that it's a mother losing her children and at the very end you find out it's a cat anyway yeah. were there any other questions that people asked or is there any other that um the audience here has um, yeah, yes I think she said there's a lot of action in it. Do you think it could be a film? Is that what you said? Oh, honey. <laughs> uh, I, I have no idea. I, I mean, I wouldn't even, when somebody, 
somebody from my hometown, you know, at church said, can I get one of your books now that you're so famous? I said, well, I'm not famous. I'm just regular old me, the same person who's always been here. If someone said to me, man, I'd like to make your book into a movie, I would not be opposed to it. So if you know somebody, go for it, sweetheart. I'd, I'd do it, but I don't. This, honest to goodness, what I have gotten from everybody in my community and this community has been overwhelming, just overwhelming. And I guess I'd uh, open it up to anybody who wants to make any other comment. I had one question for you. I'm wondering if you have a set routine for writing. Do you set aside a certain time of day or it doesn't sound like you maybe do it on your computer. Do you hand write it? Uh, that's another really great question. Yeah. Um, I have done everything, Jeanette. I've done it where I put myself on a very strict routine of you've got to get up and you've got to write before you can do anything else and all of that. It did not work for me. I've tried all different kinds of things. I think I, think I would tell this to people. If you want to do it, just do it. Give yourself permission to do it and do it whenever you can. The other thing I'd say is it's like anything. I am a person who doesn't like to sit still. I feel like I'm wasting my time. No, I found out, I was told you have to keep your butt in the seat. And that was my big thing. When I decided I was going to write and I, 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 have, I write on paper all the time. I write, I keep a notebook in my purse all the time. Scenes would come to me when I would be at a concert and I would be scribbling like mad to get the, the ideas down. Um, and those of you that have read the book, uh, La Traviata, for some reason popped into my head in the, when I wrote that chapter, I'd never heard the opera anything. And then three years later, I heard the opera and I wrote furiously through the whole thing to be able to flesh out details to make it believable. Um, I think the biggest thing is it's like anything you, just tell yourself, yes, I have permission and take the time to do it and know that it is of value even when you think it's worthless. There were many times when I thought this is garbage. And I'll, 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 I'll tell you this too, there are many chapters that are not in this book because after I wrote everything, I realized, well, it was uh, one of the people, uh, Nicholas Butler, who has written in four different languages, has his books put, published in four different languages and written many books. And he said, Victoria, you need to remember that when a person is reading a book, it's like them climbing up a mountain and they got this backpack. And every story you're telling us, every word is a rock or a stone or something in that backpack. And by the time they get to the top, they don't wanna say to themselves, now, why was I carrying that particular piece of equipment, that particular rock? when it didn't really make any sense. So there were a lot of chapters that I just hacked out because, or scenes because they didn't fit. And so I think the first part in answer to your question is write, 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 write. Just do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. And give yourself permission to do it. Second thing is then when you go back, don't be afraid to say, hmm, is this worthy of being in the backpack? I'm on Survivor mode or, or whatever that show is. And the thing is in my backpack better have meaning. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give that. It was, do you have another idea for another uh, book? Um, I actually had an idea for a prequel. I have since have ideas for a, a sequel, something to come after. I might Per current project I'm working on is a, a diary written was on yellow paper handwritten by a man um, from my area in 1932 that I think uh, should be uh, fictionalized a little bit and, and written out in a, like a little chapbook and I want to do that. The other project that I'm working on is I have two children's, uh, I have many children's stories, but two children's stories and two young adult stories, short stories that are now all at a publisher and my grandchildren um, uh, have uh, done either the cover or the illustrations for it. I'm still waiting on one of them to finish the uh, illustrations for one of the books. 
so I've got a lot of little things and I have a, um, a series of essays, I have poetry. I've had nonfiction published, but this is the first fiction I've had. And Yes, do uh, the question um, <clears throat> is when you're writing, do you have any idea of where you're going or do, is this where you're going to end up or do you just go? And I'll tell you, writers all are all over the board. I knew I had stories in my head and I wrote them as scenes. Then I had to do this hard work of putting it on a four by eight sheet of how do you build the plot? How do you build climax? How do you build characters? Where do you get the scenes? How do you make it so it flows? I know people that have uh, an outline in their head ahead of time, and then they write from that. I didn't happen to do it on this. I do think that the next book I would write, I would try very hard to have some kind of a skeleton of you know, rising action, falling action, climax, denouement. I, I, I think that would be helpful. So, yeah, but no, I didn't, I didn't have a clue. I mean, I had certain ideas of what things were going to go, but I had no idea how it was going to end. Um, I would have to say the climax scene I had written actually quite early. I did know what her fatal flaw was and that was pride. So I had that one. Can I read my last little thing before you? I want you to know that those who've grown up in the country, those who work on a farm, those who have a garden, enjoy being outside surrounded by birds and plants in abundance, feel that their life is a song. God has given us abundance of reasons to be excited about living. We just need to be aware. This novel is a song for a farm, a way of life. My gratitude to Jeanette, Rob and all the staff at Thomas St. Angelo Public Library for hosting and for all of you who are attending and those watching virtually. I am so appreciative of the blessings you give me. Thank you. Okay, I wanna thank you so much for being here tonight and uh, sharing all of your wisdom and experiences and writing uh, with us, it was really interesting and, and wonderful. I just want to highlight a couple of things that are coming up at the library. We will be doing um, virtual and in-person uh, hybrid events like this once a month. In June, it will be Katie Metzner from Rice Lake, who writes romance novels. Um, and one of her char main characters in each book has a disability, which is unusual in that genre. And she herself has um, an amputated leg from a ski accident. And that's what Kind of got her into uh, writing in that mode. Um, in July, it will be Emily Stone from the Cable um, Natural History Museum, and uh, she has written a book about dragonflies, and she has two books out, and we're going to be tying it to some outdoor activities as well. And then in August, Dave Mills, um, Cow Tales is the name of his book, and some of you may know of them from the past, but stay tuned, keep looking for our advertising. And then again, um, this is being recorded and will be available on our website. Thank you so much for participating in this experiment of online and in-person and being patient with me too. Thank you. Thank you so much.